Right. And so much energy. Oops. Not my computer. Is it better now? Probably did me. I'm sorry. Is it okay now? I think maybe you're good now. No. no. Oh, I, I, how about now? Okay. Oh, both guys. Right. Uh, yeah, hopefully there's no echo now. Yeah, thanks so much, Andrew. It's great to be here. Um, yeah, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about uh, quantum state tomography and other related things. And it's also really nice to be in front of a quantum audience. So I don't have to you know, explain uh, why quantum is so great. I'll just uh, show you uh, two one sentence thoughts about quantum that will a little bit motivate what I'm uh, working here. And then also the talk is well, like the two first two thirds of the talk is actually going to be about like um, classical stuff, classical probability uh, and statistics. Uh, but it's all motivated by the final quantum problem that we'll talk about. So anyway, first I'll tell you about how to compare two probability distributions. And then this is joint work with Steve Lange, I should say. And then uh, in this project that Steve and I were working on, we were trying to solve some quantum problem. And one thing that happened during it was we accidentally like improved the best known uh, results for some uh, analogous classical problem. So I'll tell you about that. And then we also solved some kind of quantum problem as well uh, regarding quantum state estimation. Okay, so just first of all, my two uh, one sentence thoughts about quantum that a little bit motivate what I'm going to talk about. Um, at some point, I understood that, like, I mean, one way to think about quantum mechanics is it's like a generalization of the laws of probability. And when I sort of understood this, I was so happy because it kind of meant that, like, oh, all this quantum is like probability 2.0. So, like, if you like probability, like I do, then you can just, uh, everything that's already been done, you can try to do it again, except in the world of uh, quantum states, and that could be fun. Uh, so that's one thing. Okay. Yeah, this is real probability, like the thing that you said, or you just something you can't. Oh, no, this is a real, I mean, uh, yeah, field, not computer probability. But so unless they're able to do that. Uh, no, they I don't think they've done everything. Yeah, there's still some stuff to do. Yeah. The other thing I was going to say is I think for what the most of the part, for what I'm interested in in quantum computing, it's not really about solving classical problems faster with quantum computers. It's about solving quantum problems, hopefully not slower. So if you think of like these quantum problems as generalizations of classical problems and probability, then these are generalizations that can sort of only be harder, but like hopefully we want to show they're not too much harder or maybe not harder at all. Okay, right. So now we're going to talk uh, about the classical version or analog of the quantum problem we eventually tried to work on. And but first I have to go on like a little bit of a, a mild rant about this topic of comparing these two probability distributions. So uh, the quantum state tomography problem, which we'll eventually get to, is the quantum analog of a very simple problem in classical algorithms and uh, statistics, um, which is sometimes called density estimation. It's maybe the most simple statistics problem you can imagine. There's an unknown probability distribution, P, with like D possible outcomes, 1 through D, and you get a bunch of samples from it, and you want to estimate what is this probability distribution. So you want to estimate a probability distribution, Q, as your output, but it's in some sense close to P. That's the task. Uh, but now, yeah, what does close mean? So what does it mean for two probability distributions to be close to one another? And uh, the answer to this question really, it seems to depend on who you ask. So um, I come from the area of theoretical computer science. And in theoretical computer science, the people who study this problem, they love total variation distance. I'll, I'll say what these things are a little bit if you haven't seen them before. But they, they think it's the greatest way to measure the dis difference between two probability distributions. And they would be astonished to think that there's like any other way you could try to compare two distributions. Getting some nods here. Um, <laughs> uh, quantum, maybe they don't know it, but like I think that they secretly love Hellinger distance. Hellinger distance is like maybe not so popular. You talked about classically, but for the quantum analog, it's exactly the same thing as um, fidelity or infidelity. Uh, so that's uh, everybody in quantum loves quantum fidelity, and so they kind of secretly therefore love uh, Hellinger distance. Um, people who do information theory are really into this other thing, the relative entropy or KL divergence. And there's another one called um, chi square divergence that we're eventually going to talk about quite a bit in this talk um, that's somewhat beloved by statisticians. So we have like, all these different ways to measure how close or far two probability distributions are. In fact, there are like many more. These are merely what uh, statistician Ihan Wu calls the big four. So like these are the first four that you would care about, but there's still more. Um, okay. And let me tell you a little bit about these. So um, the reason that these four are interesting is they often, or they all have some kind of natural interpretation. 
So the total variation distance between two probability distributions and P and Q is kind of about trying to answer the question. If I give you one sample that's either from P or from Q, and you have to guess, was it from P or was it from Q, total variation distance quantifies like how well you can guess. Um, how long your distance is about quantifying another thing. It's a, uh, suppose you get like a bunch of samples and they're either all from P or they're all from Q and you have to guess, was it P or was it Q? How long are squared exactly characterizes um, how many samples you need to make that uh, distinction with high confidence. And, uh, you know, KL divergence has like some uh, several interpretations in information theory. And the sky squared divergence uh, is quite relevant for this task called hypothesis testing, which I'll talk about also more in this talk, um, which is this problem. Uh, maybe you have some fixed distribution called Q in mind, like written on a piece of paper. You, maybe you hypothesize that the samples that you're getting uh, from nature are drawn from this distribution Q, but you want to test whether that's true. You want to like test if the unknown samples are really coming from Q or they're coming from something far from Q. In terms of high squared divergence, it's very relevant for this. Okay, so it's a lot to uh, take in. Um, and one other funny thing I'm going to do is I'm going to um, just square this quantity total variation distance. And uh, the reason I do that is because then these four are perfectly ordered like this. Maybe there's some factors of two, depending on how you define things. But basically, this is like the least or most liberal notion. This is like a tighter notion. This is a tighter notion. This is like a, a tighter notion, or at least maybe I didn't say that quite right. But like this, it's like the inequality say, this is always smaller than this, and this is smaller than this, and so forth. Um, while I have these slides up, I should also mention that these are both like metrics, and they're bounded between 0 and 1. And these ones are a little bit annoying. They're not even symmetric between interchanging P and Q, and they can be infinity. Um, so they're a little harder to work with. Um, OK, so because of this ordering, like this is the always the smallest and this is always the biggest, like sometimes in this talk, I will use these words. Like, let's say you've got two distributions, P and Q, and at, at like this level, the total variation, variation is squared as the most epsilon, then we can say they're close. And then if their Hellinger squared is less than epsilon, then it's like they're super close. And if their relative entropy is smaller, say they're super duper close. And like this is the strictest one. So if their high squared divergence is small, we can say they're ridiculously close. Okay. Great. So uh, if you're really good at squinting, you can read the, like a definition of all four of these things. But I'm only going to focus on two and even one of them. Uh, so just understand like what these different uh, measures are. Um, to compare two distributions P and Q, you could look at the ratio between PJ and QJ, and ideally this would be one if they're identical. If you subtract one, like you've got a sense of uh, how close they are. So if you call that error J, where J ranges from one to D, if there's D outcomes, then um, the total variation distance is like the expected value when J is drawn from Q of this error. So if you stick a square into it, then there's a square here. And conversely, the chi-square divergence is just the expected value of the square of this error. So from that, you can see from Cauchy Schwartz that the, indeed this one is always less than or equal to this one. And the Hellinger and the KL divergence kind of interpolate between these two things. Um, and part of the reason I bring this up is because um, maybe one of the nice things about chi-square, which you hear about a little bit less, is like this is like the nicest formula out of all the four of them. It has the nicest formula because there's no like absolute values or logs or anything. It's just like a polynomial in some sense of degree two. Um, OK, so if you plug the actual definition into here, you can get this other formula. And this is the formula I'm going to talk about a lot in this talk. Um, so let's take a look at it. So it's saying that the, the chi-squared divergence between probability distributions P and Q, if you just ignore this factor for a second, this yellow thing, then it looks like um, the L2 squared difference between them. So it's kind of like the L2 squared difference, except there's this uh, yellow factor here, which I'll call the penalty factor. So this is like potentially making these error terms larger, especially for the J's where QJ is small. For QJ small, the reciprocal is large, and then that uh, sort of extra penalizes your L2 squared difference. Okay. And um, yeah, without this penalty factor, you get like fifth measure of closeness is L2 squared closeness measure. Yeah. So, so how about the version of that where you just do P minus Q and you don't do the extra one of the Q in front? Is that also something else? Uh, like, uh, like if my error is just P minus Q. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. So this one total variation just is squared. I mean, I wrote it in this funny way, but another way to write it is 
without the square, it's just sum over j absolute value of tj minus tj. Seems, it seems obvious. I guess what happens to the y over q? Ah, because there's this, it's, it's kind of weird actually. It's an expectation for j drawn from q. So you can oh, I see a multiple. Oh, I see. Yeah, the 2j, and then it cancels the 2j here. So it's so clever, clever. Yeah, so it's like, these are all like divergences. If you're really into statistics, these are a family of uh, uh, yeah, ways to measure the difference between p and q. Okay. So uh, while we're on the subject, let's go back to this uh, task, uh, estimation task, bearing in mind maybe that there's different notions now of what it means for your answer, your alpha hypothesis to be close to P. Um, okay, so what's known about this task? Well, there's a very obvious algorithm across the class. You get a bunch of samples from an unknown distribution, you gotta like estimate it. The obvious algorithm is just to output the empirical distribution of the n samples that you saw. In other words, to output like QJ is, xj over n, where xj is the number of occurrences of outcome j. And how good is this algorithm? Uh, let's say, for some reason, you decided you were interested in this L2 squared error, which we're not really, it wasn't even one of the big four, but this one truly has the nicest formula. So like, as long as we're doing math, let's like uh, try to understand it. Let's see what we can figure out. So it's a little bit confusing because um, here, P is a fixed distribution, D numbers that add up to one. Q is like a random variable. It's like the output of your random algorithm that depends on the samples. So that's where the randomness is. Um, okay, so uh, the L2 squared error is this, the sum of P, uh, Pj minus Qj all squared. And then if you look at this, uh, see Qj is a random variable and its mean is Pj. <laughs> But this is actually just the variance of QJ. So it's the sum over J of the variance of QJ. And then QJ is basically a binomial random variable. So you just have like a formula for the variance. That's like PJ, one minus PJ over N. And then uh, you just drop this term, the sum of PJs is one. So this is at most one over N. So uh, this is great. I mean, like, you just like half a line, we show that the expected error of this algorithm is bounded by one over n. Um, and that's good. You could turn this on your head. You can say that, okay, with high probability, by Markov's inequality, your L2 squared error is bounded by constant over n. And therefore, you could say, oh, if I want to get the error to be epsilon, it suffices for me to take n to be like one over epsilon. Okay, so I'll like, phrase it like this. Like the sample complexity, the number of samples you need to get L2 squared error epsilon is like one of epsilon. And that's kind of nice. I mean, I like an extremely simple proof. And this also has a like, cool feature that doesn't depend on T, the number of possible outcomes. But it has the non good feature that, like, nobody cares that much about L2 squared. It's like maybe the least interesting notion of error. But uh, as a reduction, you can get like some uh, related facts for um, notions of error you care about, like the total variation distance. So it's very easy to show that by using Cauchy Schwartz that the total variation distance, which is basically like the L1 difference between P and Q, um, when squared is bounded by D times the L2 squared difference, which basically means like if you want the total variation distance to be small, it suffices to get this thing small, and we know how to get this thing or show that this thing will be small. So if we want to get this total variation distance squared to be smaller than epsilon, then it suffices to get this thing to be smaller than epsilon over D. E. And so we learned that the sample complexity of total variation distance squared being epsilon is bounded by the L2 squared sample complexity with parameter epsilon over D, e, which is like D over epsilon. And I can't remember if there's another line on this slide. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so this is like, a, in summary, like a main fact that people generally remember about this basic task of learning a distribution from samples, that if you want to get total variation distance squared epsilon, then the number of samples you need is like D over epsilon. If you want to get total variation distance epsilon, you need D over epsilon squared. Um, okay, so... That's great. It has a very simple analysis. Um, but what if you're not ambitious? You just don't want your output to be close to the truth. You want it to be ridiculously close. Like you want 
uh, this most stringent notion that the chi squared diversion should be a most epsilon. Good news, you can still have it with the same sample complexity of order d over epsilon, which is great. Like you should always remember this fact now instead of remembering this fact, because this one's like strictly better. This chi squared is always smaller, actually, than everything else. It's like smaller than KL and smaller than Hellinger and so forth. Okay, why is this true? Uh, there's two proofs I can tell you about. One proof, which is very elegant and simple, like it appears in this paper from 2015. I'm kind of surprised that this is the earliest citation I could find for this result because it's a very basic problem in statistics. Uh, so that's one proof. Now I'll show you in these slides a much worse proof that's like more ugly and it like loses some log factors. Why would I do such a thing? Well, you might guess. It's the one that's going to generalize the quantum case, as far as we know. Um, but while I'm here, let me give you uh, basically one line about proof one. Uh, so um, actually, for proof one, to get this result with chi-squared, you actually cannot do the obvious algorithm. Because the obvious algorithm, that just output the, output the empirical distribution, as the feature that it might estimate some probability to be zero, even though the true probability is not zero, but is like, extremely small. And if you plug that into the, the definition of chi-square divergence, you'll see that if you do that, then the chi-square divergence of your estimate is infinity. So basically, with the chi-square algorithm, like you should never guess that something's probability is zero, because if you're even a tiny bit wrong, then you get infinitely penalized. Uh, so what you just do is you do the obvious algorithm, but you fictitiously start out all your accounts for the d different outcomes at one. Uh, so then you'll never output zero. And then, I mean, I didn't put it on the slides, but you can do a similar thing where you say, okay, I'm just going to try to compute the expectation of the chi-squared error. And because this formula for chi-squared is like not that bad, it's kind of like quadratic, it's some kind of exercise, it's not too hard to get like literally an exact formula for it as a function of the PJs. And this exact formula is basically D minus one over N plus one, which is basically D over N. And that's about it. Because then it just says like, oh, if you want your error to be like epsilon, then you just need to get n such that d over n is epsilon, which is n uh, being d over epsilon. Yeah, so maybe should be bothered by the fact that it's the same for like the least uh, tight and the super ridiculously tight. It means that they're not too far from each other or something. Um, Given the names that you gave, it looks like yeah, different. No, they, there's definitely distributions where these things can be much different. Um, to find out, well, I guess the point is, uh, it just it can happen, I guess. I mean, you can learn things extremely well with this complexity, but you can also prove a lower bound. These things are tight, by the way, um, that says even if you only are motivated to get total variation distance squared of epsilon, you still need to over epsilon samples. So I'm just trying to think on the fly whether that means the hard case for learning. Um, is like a case where there's not much difference between the total variation distance and the chi squared divergence. I have to think about it. Um, the hard case is, by the way, just like uh, you know, all the probabilities are either one plus epsilon over d or one minus epsilon over d. You have to kind of figure out for each one whether it's plus epsilon or minus epsilon. Yeah. What is d? Oh, sorry, I, I said D is the number of outcomes for P. So we assume the unknown distribution uh, has D outcomes that we just call one through D. And like, so P is just D numbers that add up to one. Yeah. So like the output, I mean, the thing you have to, have to output Q is like D numbers. So maybe you shouldn't be too surprised, but like it's like reasonable that like D is showing up in the complexity of how many samples you need to estimate D numbers. Okay, so now let me show you uh, proof two, the less good one, but this is like the most complicated part of the talk. Um, okay. So our plan now, we wanna get this ridiculously good estimate of the distribution, and it's gonna be actually a black box reduction from knowing that you can get a really good L2 squared algorithm. So, you know, our budget for samples is like D over epsilon. If you remember, like the L2 squared sample complexity of getting some target error is like the reciprocal of that. So you can actually afford with this many samples to get like an estimate Q whose L2 squared error is bounded by epsilon over D. 
So you'll do that to start. Um, then it's a like, very minor step. Like once you get this estimate, maybe just rearrange the names of the outcomes so that uh, one through D so that your estimates are in descending order. So at this point, your estimate might look like this. This is like your estimate. There's like D numbers here. And I arrange them in descending order, and you like estimate that the outcome one is probably 30%, outcome two is probably 20%, and, and so forth. This could be your initial estimate. Okay, so uh, the next step is to what I'll call freeze all the estimates QJ, or QJ is at least basically one over D, let's say one over four D. And what I mean by freeze is like basically you're announcing to the world, like at the end of the day, these are going to be my estimates for these particular outcomes. We're going to try to refine these later, but like from now on, like this will be my final answer for these ones. And given that you've kindly decided these will be your final estimates for you know elements one through whatever, you can kind of already compute like how much chi-squared error they're costing you. So let's do that. So the chi-squared error incurred by like these estimates just out here, what's the sum over all these uh, frozen j's, if you will, of like the penalty factor times the like L2 squared error. And if you remember the penalty factor in this chi-square divergence is like the reciprocal of the Q. Um, but like all the frozen Q's are at least one over 4D, which means the reciprocal is like at most 4D. So it means like all these penalty factors are at most 4D. And then, so if you just call these 4D, what you're left with is like the L2 squared error on the frozen J's, and that's at most the total L2 squared error, which is at most epsilon over D by, you know, the fact that you did this L2 squared estimation algorithm. Okay, and if you multiply these together, like the total error is order epsilon. So, kind of, you know, we're eventually going to use some loose and log factors, by the way, but by basically like, you know, this is our sample budget, and this is like our error budget. And so far we've already got the right number of samples and the right amount of error. And we've somehow maybe made some progress in estimating a bunch of the probabilities. Um, and another minor observation is, uh, so all the remaining J's, your estimate is smaller than one over 4D. And it's not too hard to show that your estimates are like sufficiently reasonably good, that that means the true probabilities, the PJ's are smaller than let's say one over 2D. And there's almost D of them, which means that the sum of the remaining PJs is at most uh, a half. So this is like some amount of progress you've made. So let me summarize on this next slide what's sort of happened so far. We used order D over epsilon samples. Uh, we did the L2 squared error estimator. We froze some of our estimates. The total chi squared error we incurred so far is order epsilon. And we also have that the remaining unfrozen probability mass is at most a half. Okay, so the plan for finishing this high squared learning algorithm is to repeat like this, whatever I've just done, like logarithmically many times. And maybe you're like, I don't quite understand what you mean by that. Yeah, I'll come back to that in a second. But uh, we're gonna repeat it like logarithmically many times. And as we do this, like we'll sort of freeze more and more estimates and the unfrozen probability mass will like go down to like a quarter, an eighth, a 16th, one over 32 and so forth. Until such time as like the unfrozen probability mass is like really, really small. It's like smaller than epsilon over D. So I have logarithmically many steps. And at that point, you're like, okay, the remaining part of the distribution that I haven't estimated is like really negligible. And you can do a tiny calculation to show that you can just estimate all the remaining tiny ones by epsilon over D. You shouldn't estimate them by zero, but if you estimate them by epsilon over D, then this also doesn't incur much chi-squared error. You can just check it incurs the most order epsilon chi-squared error. And therefore, the conclusion is that with like, D over epsilon times a log factor many samples, you can get chi-squared error that's like epsilon also times a log factor. And if you rearrange the log factors, maybe you get the desired sample complexity times like a couple of log factors. So that's the plan. The last thing I didn't exactly explain is like, how does it mean, I mean, how do you like refine this estimate so like you get more frozen estimates? Uh, okay, so 
So let's say we've been doing this process for a while and we got to the kth stage and the unfrozen probability mass is uh, alpha, which is maybe two to the minus k. Actually, I guess you have to actually estimate as alpha, but let's just say that it's two to the minus k. It goes down like half order eight, et cetera. Okay, so here's the, the final idea. Um, consider this probability distribution, which is like P, the original distribution, conditioned on just being from the unfrozen outcomes. So you could just like get samples from P and discard all the ones that correspond to frozen outcomes. And then it'll be as though you're getting samples from P conditioned on unfrozen. Now that'll have some slowdown because like the unfrozen things only have an alpha probability mass. So you basically get like a factor of one over alpha like slowdown. It takes you like this many samples from P to get like one sample from P conditioned on unfrozen. Doesn't seem great, but um, okay. So what we're going to do to get like refined estimates is still use that like L2 squared error estimator. And so we're going to try to get like, use it to get like a, an estimator R of like the condition on unfrozen distribution. And this is always our sample budget, D over epsilon. But I mean, with D over epsilon samples, it's kind of like we only get um, uh, alpha times D over epsilon samples because of the slowdown. And therefore the error we get is like the reciprocal of this is like worse. The error is like not epsilon over D, but epsilon over D with alpha also in the denominator, which is bad because alpha is small. So it doesn't seem so great, but it's actually okay, weirdly, by some arithmetic. So let's look at this arithmetic. Um, this is the guarantee that we know that uh, this estimator R, if you sum it even, over everything, but in particular, if you sum over the unfrozen J, it's the L2 squared error it makes. So that's RJ minus, and this is the probability of J in this condition distribution, it's just whatever PJ was divided by the total unfrozen probability mass. It's bounded by epsilon over D alpha. And then you just multiply both sides of this inequality by alpha squared. And then if you do that, then on the right, you get alpha in the numerator. And then you get like an alpha inside the parentheses. So you get uh, sum over j of pj minus alpha rj squared is bounded by s. And what that's saying is that like, if you take the alpha rj's as we have your estimate of the unfrozen pj's, the L2 squared error is pretty good actually. It's actually better than epsilon over d. It's like alpha times epsilon over d. And that's, Good, because if we take these alpha rj's as our new estimates, qj, because it's even smaller than epsilon over d, we can like tolerate a larger penalty factor than we used to tolerate, which is good because these new estimates, these Q, new qj's are like smaller. And we want this penalty factor is like the reciprocal of the, the qj's. So for target error of epsilon, we can tolerate a penalty factor of 4d over alpha. Uh, in other words, it's okay to freeze the new QJs that are at least alpha over 4D. It's like the ones that are at least alpha over 4D, they're penalty factor when you compute the chi-square divergence, it's like 4D over alpha. And so if you multiply that against this, you get um, epsilon. And that means that the remaining QJs that you still haven't frozen are all smaller than alpha over 4D. So the associated PJs, which are close to them, are also more or less smaller than alpha. You can arrange that they're smaller than alpha over 2D. There's the most D of them, so their sum is at most alpha over 2. So you've kind of done one stage. You've got the unfrozen probability maths down by a factor of 2. Yeah. So it looks sort of wasteful. Like after you've frozen some stuff, you just like ignore them, right? So uh, if you kept them, could you group like one of your logs, like the one on the, the second one? Oh, yeah, very good. You're the first person to notice uh, this. I also didn't sort of notice until I was making the slide. But yeah, you don't actually really need to like draw more samples. You can like just reuse your samples. Um, and you can get rid of at least one of the logs. Uh, yeah, you're going to get rid of at least one of the logs in this way. Um, yeah. What about correlation? Um, basically, you're just going to do, yeah, there's one log log that I'm ignoring because you just sort of want to show that each of these log many stages, uh, you get this like desired accuracy with high probability. Um, and then it's you use a union bound. So it doesn't even matter if the samples, you reuse the samples. 
Okay, so um, the summary of what you should remember about this grungy proof is with uh, around D over epsilon samples, you can estimate an unknown distribution on D outcomes to chi squared closeness epsilon. Um, and moreover, it's a black box reduction from L2 squared estimation. Basically, whatever you want to get chi squared error epsilon, then the sample complexity is basically the sample complexity of getting L2 squared error epsilon over D times some polylog factors. And um, yeah, the point is going to be the same in the quantities. Okay, so uh, let me start to tell you about some of the quantum things that we did. So uh, Steve and I were trying to solve like a quantum version of like a classical uh, uh, learning problem, which I'm not going to properly define here. I have these like slides just for like some color. <laughs> so don't ask too many questions about them. But uh, let's say you're trying classically trying to learn a distribution on n-bit strings, but it's not any old distribution. It's like a Markov random field and the underlying graph is a tree. That's like some special kind of distribution you might try to learn. And even back in like the 1960s, these two people called Chow and Liu were like, we have a good idea for how to do this. And they proposed an algorithm. And they showed that their algorithm like, you know, gets error zero if you give it infinity samples. That was good. Um, but then, you know, much later, uh, some computer scientists were like, well, what if you just have n samples? Like, does that give you a small error? And they had this nice paper where they showed that this problem was doable with like roughly n over epsilon samples. That was nice. And uh, Steve and I were like, let's do the quantum version of this. We're like, these are qubits and it'll be fun. Uh, and the key aspect of the, the Chow Liu algorithm is in, the, in this problem, you don't actually see the tree. You just see n-bit strings and you promise there is some unknown tree. So like stage one of the algorithm is to try to figure out what the tree is. And the tree controls like how the different bits are like um, correlated with each other. In particular, like long story short, these distributions have the property that um, if you have like three bits, like A, B, and C of the uh, n, n bits, um, if it's like this picture, then like bit A and bit B are independent, conditioned on the outcome of bit C. That's like a nice feature of these distributions. And so if you're doing this algorithm, that is to say the mutual information between A and B is zero, conditioned on uh, the value of C. And so uh, if you're trying to learn this distribution, the first thing you try to do is figure out the tree. And that means the first thing you try to figure out is like which pairs of bits are conditionally independent of each other, conditioned on some third bit. Yeah, yeah. and you said, don't ask questions. Yeah. So you're not given the tree. Yeah, you're not you given the tree. promise that it is some tree, that you need to learn the tree. Yeah. And also, you didn't really quite define what the tree means. That's right. Yeah. I'm not going to, but yeah, uh, I can tell you after. Um, yeah. We'll try to learn what you mean. Yeah, very good. Yeah, yeah. you're learning from very few samples. But <laughs> some kind of uh, <laughs> try to do ridiculously good error. This is also, yeah, I to like this part where um like uh, a key ingredient in their uh, algorithm was like a mutual information tester. And what that means is it's like a testing algorithm where you're getting samples of just two bits. And you're trying to tell if this distribution on two bits has the property that it's like a product distribution and the bits are independent, or it's like far from a product distribution. And uh, let's say far from a product distribution in the sense that like there's a lot of mutual information between the two bits. And so they gave like an efficient statistical algorithm for this. And that would like solve some open problems. So they're happy about that. Uh, okay, so let me focus in a little bit on this uh, specific independence tester. And they did it uh, not just actually for when you're getting samples from two bits, but when you're getting like samples from two things that come from D possibilities or Q bits, if they're going to be um, quantum. Uh, right, so the situation here is you get like draws with distribution P on um, uh, like a product set A times B, where A and B are both of size D. And uh, basically, if um, if it's truly a product distribution, P is the product of the two marginals, then this algorithm will output they're independent with high probability. And if it's like far from being a product distribution, if the mutual information between A and B, these two random variables, is bigger than epsilon, then it'll detect that with high probability. 
and the number of samples you need scales basically linearly with one over epsilon and quadratically with d. So that was that result. And oops, uh, Steve and I, like one thing we did was like we proved the quantum analog of this, which I'll explain a bit about later. And then we were like, oh, great. Now the next step is to prove the version where you don't just look for mutual information, but conditional mutual information. You may know that like in quantum land, like conditional mutual information is like very, very complicated. It's very complicated. And so we got stuck and we couldn't do it. So we were like, oh, we'll save it for later. Just declare victory here. Um, but funnily enough, like once we solved this, we looked back at our proof and we we're like, oh, I wonder if you just specialize this proof, the classical case, what do you get? And it turns out you solve this problem, but like with a better sample complexity than they solved the problem. It's better by a factor of basically D. That's like another nice feature of like, I don't know, solving quantum problems. Sometimes you accidentally solve classical problems too. Um, okay, so I'll continue the story. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how we tackled this problem of independence testing. You get samples from like two random variables and you wanna tell are they independent or they have a lot of mutual information. An ingredient for this is another kind of statistic problem called hypothesis testing. What's hypothesis testing? Hypothesis testing is uh, you let Q be like a known fixed distribution on D outcomes, like you have it in your hands, and you're given samples from an unknown distribution P, and you want to like accept or reject the hypothesis that P really is Q. So you want to like accept if P is actually your hypothesis distribution, and reject if P is far from being your hypothesis distribution. And uh, this problem was tackled pretty recently in the classical case. And it turns out the algorithm for doing this, like the, the, the good way to do this, um, involves estimating empirically the chi square divergence between the unknown distribution P and your hypothesis Q. And this turns out to be the right thing to do, partly because when Q is regarded as fixed, the formula for chi-square divergence is literally a polynomial in the PJ. It's, it's a degree two polynomial. So it's really a natural thing to estimate. And the theorem is a little bit confusing, but like um, the theorem from these papers is that uh, if you get like square root D over epsilon samples, which is pretty good. It's better than the complexity for, of D over epsilon for learning P. You're not trying to learn the whole distribution P. You're just trying to tell, is it Q or not? Um, with square root D over epsilon samples, you get an algorithm which, you know, accepts if P is ridiculously close to Q, chi squared uh, divergence is small, and it rejects if like P is not super close to Q. So um, the original versions of this problem just wanted you to like accept if P equals Q and reject if P is far from Q in total variation distance. And like, this is like a stronger version of that on both sides. So this is a theorem that you know we're gonna like just remember in black box in our minds. And I should also add that like there's a quantum version of this um, that I did in a paper with uh, Badescu and Wright. And the quantum version of this problem, where these are mixed states rather than probability distributions, um, the sample complexity, the number of copies you need is like d over epsilon. And this is like an instance, actually, a little bit, if you remember, like, on slide one, where it's like, oh, we always want to do the quantum versions of the problem, maybe, like, not worse than the classical versions of the problems. This kind of is, like, not worse. It looks a little bit worse because, like, here it's D and here it's square root D. But, like, a mixed quantum state of dimension D has, like, D squared parameters. So it's, it's natural that you'll, like, need quadratically many more in D samples. This yep. thing was, like, with high probability. Yeah, this theorem is like, uh, for this, it's like like constantly high probability. And you can do this thing of like repeating many times. And uh, if you want failure probability delta, get like a log one over delta here. You probably even do better than that. And statisticians really focus on that parameter. And computer scientists like me never pay much attention to it. Can you just say a few more words about the quantum version? What, can you make a measurement, any measurement? Yeah, so the quantum version is um, you have like the classical description of a, a mixed state sigma, that's the analog of Q. And you can get like n copies of rho. So you get like a, a mixed, unknown mixed state rho. So you get like a rho tensor n. And in this version, you can do anything like you want with them. You can do like entangled measurements or whatever. And you're trying to tell if they're, in this case, like close in chi squared divergence. 
or far in fidelity. Okay. So that's like a black box, uh, we'll remember for this like one slide about the task of mutual information testing or testing if um, to probability distributions, uh, well, a probability distribution on a, a bipartite set has independent marginals right now. So the way this works is, okay, you're getting samples from this distribution P on D cross D. Here's what you do. First thing you do is you're like, well, from P, I can just ignore the B half and get samples from P, the marginal on A, and I can also get samples from the marginal on B. So I'll just learn both of these distributions to like ridiculous closeness, high squared closeness, using, you know, like the grungy algorithm we talked about or the more elegant version, and get estimates for the two marginals called QA and QB. And we can get like high squared closeness with like B over epsilon samples of the error epsilon. And then it's like a simple fact that like high squared is kind of additive when you take product distribution. So that means um, QA cross QB is close to PA cross PB. Okay, so we're going to call Q the product of the two estimates. And you know that like Q is very, very, very close to the product of the marginals of the unknown distribution P. And what you're really trying to test here is like, is it true that P is equal to the product of its marginals? That's what it means for a distribution to be uh, independent halves. And now you just pretend like, oh, I've learned the product of the marginal so well, it's like so ridiculously close. I'll just pretend that like that's exactly right. And then it's a hypothesis testing problem. You want to know like, is this unknown distribution P, you know, equal to this Q, which is basically the product of the marginals. Mm -hmm. And so you can do hypothesis testing on P with like Q as your known hypothesis. And the cost of that is square root the domain size for P which is d squared uh, over epsilon. So this also costs you d over epsilon samples. And uh, this is basically it. This is how you get like a d over epsilon sample algorithm for hypothesis testing or for independence testing. There's some other like minor lemma where like this hypothesis testing algorithm is about Hellinger squared and you really want something about mutual information. There's like some little lemma that lets you pass between these two things at the expense of the factor. But um, the thing I want you to take away from this is that like crucial to making this whole plan work and getting this result about mutual information testing is that um, this hypothesis testing step, which would be black box, really needed ridiculous closeness. And therefore it was like crucial that like in step one, you could learn the unknown distributions to chi-squared closeness effectively. Um, so if you want to do a quantum version of this, which we did, part two was actually already done. That was like some from previous paper I mentioned, but part one had not been done. Like finally, like it motivates you to solve the quantum state tomography problem or quantum state estimation problem, but with like ridiculous closeness with like high square divergence as your figure of merit. And ideally you would have like this many samples d squared over epsilon. So uh, that's what we did. Now, uh, I had in my mind, this will take too long to like do all of this, but there's a version of this that takes part four that takes six minutes. I'll do that. So I'll like cut halfway through step part four. Because basically, to be honest, like part four is, uh, it's exactly the same as the classical case. And actually, therefore, the only mystery is like, what is the definition of chi-squared divergence for quantum states? And then once you know that, it's the same as the classical case. So uh, basically, I just want to tell you that. So uh, yeah, now estimating a quantum state or quantum state tomography, it's exactly the same problem, except that you're learning the mixed state of a, a d-dimensional uh, system. And we can again ask the same question. What does it mean to for like two states, rho and sigma, to be close? And once again, there's like at least four actually infinitely many, but like there's at least four like popular choices. There's trace distance, which is exactly the analog of total variation distance. There's Burris distance, which is uh, the exact analog of Hellinger. It's also like one minus fidelity. There's quantum relative entropy, which is for some reason denoted by an S. And there's chi-squared divergence, uh, sometimes called Burris chi-squared divergence. 
Actually, there's like infinitely many natural versions of these two things, but you have one of them. And uh, just be, as before, they're like, again, perfectly ordered, at least if you square this one. So like, this is the smallest and this is the largest. So you have the same adjectives here. And so remember the classical case, I showed you at first, like an extremely simple classical algorithm for L2 squared learning using like one of our epsilon samples. And we're going to look the same thing here in the quantum case. We're going to want like L2 squared state tomography. And uh, that exists. So in the paper I had with John Wright, we gave a not especially simple algorithm uh, to estimate an unknown quantum state rho with L2 squared accuracy epsilon using D over epsilon copies, which is tight actually. And uh, this just means the Frobenius square distance between them. And it's not so easy. It uses representation theory. Um, there's a version with uh, complexity d squared over epsilon that is easy if you don't mind losing a factor of d. But again, basically, you can like plan it, so you can black box this fact, and then basically, as before, like boost it all the way to chi square divergence at the expense of replacing epsilon by epsilon over d, basically. Yep. When you say it's not easy, do you mean that the proof is not easy or that the algorithm is not easy? Yes. Oh. I guess the algorithm is like polynomial circuit complexity, but it's not very simple, and the proof isn't that simple either. Uh, I believe it's polynomial in log D even. Oh, but I always have to double check this point. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's not the six minute. Yeah, not the six minute version. Yeah. So, uh, yep. Is there any Explanation why the quantity of the problem depends on D, but transform Yeah, there kind of is. Uh, I can't say it extremely quickly, but like the, the difficult case for this is where like the unknown state is like the maximally mixed state on some half of the dimensions. And somehow just to identify like most of the dimensions of uh, this uh, row does require some D dependence. Whereas in the classical case where you get, where you get samples, like, well, okay, you know, maybe we'll have to discuss it later. Um, so yeah, so uh, in a similar way, you can get immediately from this, like a trace distance bound using Cauchy-Schwartz. And so this is like a popular thing to remember about quantum state tomography, d squared over epsilon with uh, trace distance uh, root epsilon. Um, yeah, so, uh, this other works by Ha et al. got infidelity epsilon using basically the same number of samples. So like that's better because this infidelity is always bigger than trace distance squared. And then I had some other paper where we're like trying to like improve this some more and there's more representation theory and we kind of got stuck. But yeah, I'm here to report, you know, in this current paper, a similar thing where we show that you can get chi squared tomography with this uh, ridiculous chi squared closeness still using like d squared over epsilon copies of the unknown states. And moreover, it's by black box reduction from the L2 squared algorithm in the same, basically in the same way as in the classical case. So we only needed like this much representation theory. And I guess the last thing I'll tell you is um, basically this, just what is the definition of chi squared, quantum chi squared divergence? And then that's where I'll end. Um, so one feature of it, like every good distance between two quantum uh, states, it's unitarily invariant. So if you have rho and sigma and they have some distance between them and then you do the same unitary to both of them, it doesn't change chi-squared divergence. That's natural. And therefore it means if I wanna tell you what is chi-squared divergence, I can assume without loss of generality that one of these states is already diagonal. In fact, I'll assume that uh, sigma is diagonal and I can even assume that like the diagonal entries are decreasing. So I can just tell you what is chi-squared divergence between a general row and a diagonal sigma. So that's the picture. And it's this, it's, it's pretty much the Frobenius squared distance between them, like the sum of the squares of the entry differences, except there's a penalty G factor for every one of the D squared entries. And the penalty factor for entry IJ it's like two over qi plus qj. 
Um, so it's like a reciprocal somehow of the Qs again. I ordered them, okay, so QI plus QJ is basically the same thing as the maximum of QI and QJ. And I ordered them, so this is the biggest, the next biggest, and this is the smallest. So uh, like, I don't know, these are like I and J, the biggest one is here, and the smaller one is here. So um, this is the picture. Like you take the L2 square difference uh, between these two matrices, but there's like a penalty factor for each entry. And like the penalty factor for these like light green entries is the reciprocal of this entry. The penalty factor for these like orange entries is the reciprocal of this entry and so forth. And then once you have that, like the reduction for like learning a quantum state, chi squared error, it's like you just learn it to L2 squared error and then like you freeze a bunch of diagonal entries and then you kind of refer on the remaining um, submatrix. So yeah, it's three things like this. And yeah, maybe you could uh, do it yourself with this level of hints. Okay, so uh, just one or two slides of summary. Uh, so one thing we did at the end was we did quantum state tomography with like the strictest maybe notion of closeness, this chi squared divergence, but with the same sample complexity that was previously known for infidelity or trace distance. And from this, we also got like a testing algorithm that can test uh, whether a bipartite state has uh, is a product state or versus has mutual information epsilon between the two parts with a sample complexity that's basically linear in one over epsilon. And for some open problems, one open problem is, you know, is there like a simple algorithm and or analysis for quantum state tomography with L2 squared error epsilon? Um, I, I think really cared about this much before because we were like, well, L2 squared error for Venus error is like a dumb notion of error. So why would I be motivated to do this? But it turns out like that's like, you know, the black box component that gives you even like chi squared divergence or infidelity or whatever. So it'd be nice if there's like, a simple version of this algorithm. And another question is like, even for Q bits, forget Q dits, uh, can you get like a quantum conditional mutual information vector? So you get like samples from like a three qubit state and you want to know is the conditional mutual information zero or is it at least epsilon? And that seems at least to us to be a lot harder. So we don't know how to solve that problem. And that's it, thanks. Yeah. Um, so I, I must miss a right at the beginning, but could you give us your definition of a sample? Oh, okay. Yeah. In in uh, the classical case, it means like uh, just if you ask if you ask for n samples, it means you get like n independent, identically distributed draws from. And in the quantum case, to get like a sample, usually called a copy of the unknown state row, it's just you get a copy of row tensor product n. So, and then the, the measurements that you apply to that, is that also part of your approach or is that just? Yeah, then the algorithmic task is like, how should I measure this and convert the measurement outcome to an estimate for row? And is that something that's covered in what you described now? Because I didn't get any sense of that here. Yeah, so in, in both cases, in the quantum case, like you just, um, well, the main thing is like, first you try to uh, get a, a, an estimation algorithm in L2 squared error. So you do like whatever the algorithm is for this L2 squared uh, quantum state tomography algorithm. And that one is like something where like you take the space in which everything is happening, like CD tensor N times, and use this like decomposition of it from representation theory into like uh, irreducible representations. And you measure that. And so it's a very complicated entangled measurement. Um, actually, one nice feature is I can also add our reduction for converting like an L2 squared uh, quantum estimator tomography algorithm to a chi squared divergence one. It's pretty simple. It preserves the property of whether or not uh, the measure or the algorithm does entangled measurements or not. So if you plug in like a simple L2 squared algorithm that maybe measures each copy separately, 
then the overall algorithm for chi-square divergence will also measure each property um, separately, which is like nicer and maybe more practical. And so like there is this L2 squared error estimation algorithm in the quantum case with worth complexity by a factor of D, but with this like simple property that measures each of the copies um, separately. So that's a component of the algorithm. Yeah. So I think I remember, maybe I'm misremembering, is it possible like if you allow for like adaptivity, is it possible to replace your complicated representation theory measurement with like something copy by copy measurement? Oh, yeah, good question. Another uh, aspect of all these algorithms is, there's even maybe like three levels of like simplicity for your algorithm. Like the most complicated is like general entangled measurement. The least complicated is like, not just you measure each copy separately, but like you decide in advance like how you're gonna measure each copy and then you just do it. The intermediate level, which is maybe nice because like it's still probably more doable is, you know, you measure your first copy, you get some results. And then based on that, you decide how to measure the second copy. And then based on those results, you decide how to measure the third copy and so forth. And it's actually known that like this adaptive version of single copy measurement can be more powerful. Like you need this in order to get like one over epsilon scaling for infidelity as your error metric. Um, no, I forget. What can, you that that can, you, can you get a, do as well as your fully entangled measure using adaptive single copy measure? Uh, you can with the epsilon scaling. The d scaling will be worse by a factor of d. But maybe in real life, it would be much more practical. Yep. Uh, so in the conditional mutual information version, that is. Yeah. Um, like classically, the conditional mutual information will become the difference of two mutual informations. So does that not happen in the quantum case or is the... Oh, yeah, that's a very excellent question too. It does happen in the quantum case, but in the classical case, like a better thing happens, which is that it's also true that like the conditional mutual information condition on C is equal to the expectation of the mutual information. You take expectation over C. And so the conditional mutual information is like an average of mutual information. And so it's like an average of things that are like, patently non-negative. And so like, it's not, it's a very easy reduction in the classical case to get conditional mutual information. Um, but in the quantum case, like there's no result like that. And the only definition of conditional mutual information in the quantum case is like, it's the difference of two entropies. And now it's terrible because like, you do know for some extremely complicated reason that this difference is non-negative, but like, that's a deep theorem. And so like the testing thing you're asking for is like, oh, I want to not only I have to really understand the case when it's zero. And in fact, I have to sort of robustly understand the case when it's zero. And it's like not even obvious, like that obvious that it's not negative. So that makes, at least for us, the quantum problem a lot harder. Yep. So is a version of the quantum problem that you saw kind of fully general? Uh, like when you're which, saying, which one? Uh, for this like tree problem, you saw you saw oh. the quantum version, they don't have it. Information. Yeah, so we didn't solve anything about that tree problem, uh, sadly. Um, we solved like the first ingredient that the classical people used. And we were like, oh, we're just going to quantize the second ingredient and the third ingredient, and we'll solve the quantum version of Chao Liu. And we got the first ingredient, and we got stuck on the second ingredient. So we don't have anything for that problem, the quantum version of it. Okay, thanks again. Thanks a lot. Yes.